Hi guys. Hey. Hi. Good to see you. Got, got a uh, kind of a treat for you today. My good friend Paul Therrien and I are going to talk to you a little bit about Foursquare. Foursquare is getting your board square and perpendicular and all the, the condition that it needs to be in so it's usable. Because usually when we buy them they're not. I don't think that's going to fill up the entire class. We're going to show you some widgets and we're going to show you how we do it uh, without all the widgets also. Well, I think there's going to be plenty of time left over for question and answer. Paul is a master carpenter's master carpenter. He really has done work in, uh, for Elton John. When I worked, uh, I worked at a mansion, about a $15 million mansion, and I lasted for a year and a half. And then they ran me off. But Paul has been there 12 years. And then I quit. <laughs> and then he quit. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, so be thinking when we get to that part of today, be thinking about questions you have just for cabinet making, furniture making in general. If you're having trouble, maybe, maybe you got a question about biscuit joints, maybe you got a question about mortise and tenon, maybe you got a question about anything but turning stuff. And I was talking to, to uh, Tracy out here today who works uh, here at Peachtree, and he said, you're doing four square, Did you, do you know that much about a table saw? <laughs> yeah, I do. Well, he didn't know. He said, I thought you were a big turner. Yeah, I am. But in a previous life, I've built well over a thousand pieces of custom furniture. I started this club in 1998 when I worked at Home Depot. I'm a trim carpenter. I've trimmed entire subdivisions. So, yes, I turn now. Yes, I make a living now. But that doesn't mean I don't know other stuff. I do. I just finished a project for a big catering company, uh, a cabinet project that took 58 sheets of plywood and 40 sheets of black plastic laminate out of my garage. So I do this stuff. So anyway, so the format is going to be uh, how to get things square and true and flat and all that. Um, question. I want you guys to vote. Between Paul and I, do we own 6-inch joiners, 8-inch joiners, 12-inch joiners, or 16-inch joiners? Is there all of the above? <laughs> oh. How about none of the above? Yeah, none of the above. Yeah. How about none of the above? I think the latter. Yeah, we don't own joiners. Yeah, really. Take up floor space. Four spaces, value. Now, I did. I, I had a six inch joiner and I wanted uh, a great big one. And then this guy said, eh, What do you need that for? Let me show you how to do it this way. So I did. I hadn't used my joiner in five years, so I sold it. But uh, anyway, so we're going to show you stuff. There are some things you need. Most of them you can make or you can buy them, and you can buy them right here. So, um, anything you want to say before we, we start? No, like I said, the main reason I don't have a joiner, uh, because they are handy for quick going over and flattening some. It's pretty, it's, it's nice to have one for quickness. Yeah. But like I said, they take up floor space and working in a small shop, I'd rather have my floor space. And yeah. I'm going to get into flattening a board without a joiner shortly, so you'll yeah. see our method. So it's something I do have in the shop all the time is a planer. So we're going to work with a planer instead of a, a joiner. We use a planer a lot like a lot of people would use a joiner. Okay, uh, they are not interchangeable uh, necessarily, but you can make them, if you know some tricks and stuff, you can make them do pretty much the same thing. All right, so uh, let's talk about boards. When you buy a board or store a board and you first look at it, you know, it looks uh, reasonably straight, although this one is exaggerated, so it doesn't. When you buy a board at the lumberyard or the Home Depot or wherever you get it, can you depend on one of, at least one of the edges to be straight? Well, they straight line rip it, right? <laughs> yeah, it depends on the yard moves. depends on what you're buying. Maybe what? It depends on the yard and depends on what you're buying. I have swanny straight line rips one side. Yeah, is it straight? Uh, no. When it comes no. off the saw, sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is not a trick question. The answer is no. It's not straight. So let's, for a mindset, so we can kind of have a little track to run on, let's assume that hypothetically we're going to be making a, uh, 
a raised panel. We're going to glue up, because um, this isn't wide enough, we're going to glue up a panel for our raised panel, and then we're going to make rails and styles out of this one. So following on that track, the reason you need things to be square and 90 degrees, not 88 degrees, is when you assemble stuff, if it's not square, um, it's not going to be flat. And it's not going to stay flat, and you're going to have gaps, and people will know that you don't have a clue. So uh, we the actually... The door won't fit in its hole. Or it won't fit in its hole. Or, or if it does, it'll fit in its hole, and one side will stick out. I had that happen a few times. Okay. So anyway, um, we have a saw stop here. They're not going to let me run it. That's fine and dandy. There's some things I need to tell you about the saw. And the, the main thing that the underlying uh, point of all of this is you want to take um, the human variable out when you're trying to do this as much as possible. Uh, you'd like to just stand back and wish it into existence. I know that's how some of you operate now, but that won't work. What you want to do is when you feed material through the saw, let's say, and, and let me talk about um, the degrees of accuracy. For most of the everyday stuff you do, you don't need to be super accurate. But when you need to be super accurate, you need to be able to. Um, so if, we're, if this is a project, we're not just ripping something to make something for the workshop, but we really want it to be accurate, when you feed a piece through, just as an example, you wouldn't really feed this through. But if you're gonna, gonna feed this through, you wouldn't feed it through and then stop and push and stop it. You don't stop and go. So you, you don't do this and then move your hand back and do this. That is, that is not correct. What you wanna do is a continuous motion. You want this to move all the way through. The very best thing you could have is a power feeder. Why? Because when you put that wood under there, all the stresses, all the pressures, all the speed are constant. They don't change. So that's what you want to try to mimic. If you're going to put this through, you wouldn't want to stop in the middle. Okay. Also, uh, this particular fence, it's not a bad fence. It's adjustable. So when you get your fence, if you haven't ever adjusted the holding power, you need to do that. Because generally, the power here it is kind of snug. But this thing will actually move. And I don't know, maybe the camera can see this. Let's see what we've got. This is a dial indicator. They're checking run out on the blade. But I want to show you what happens just on your feed. And this, I have a Delta Unisaw with the, uh, the great big extruded aluminum fence. And I thought, man, that's rigid, man. That's like concrete. That is going to move. And after I got with this guy, it moves a lot. Which, so which fence are you talking about, Ron? Not the Beast The Unifence. The Unifence. It's, it's, it's an extruded aluminum fence. What they call a T fence. Okay, not, so, not very similar to the Beast Meyer. Oh God, I don't know. I burned the motor out on it, and I called Stone Mountain Power Tool and I asked if it was still under warranty. And they said, When did you buy it? I said, 1986. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, Probably not. <laughs> so you know, I've had mine a long time. Okay, can we see the dial? Yeah. We can. All right, so just when you're, when you're pushing something through here, you want to um, try to hold it up against the fence so it doesn't move, right? Well, look, look how much movement you get. And this particular one locks on the outside. See, it's got a lock out here. Well, a whole lot of fences anchor here, period. And there's nothing on the outside. So... This saw is running at about 6,000 RPMs, making a lot of noise, and you're just a little bit nervous, and you're pushing way harder than you think you are, and you just get all sorts of movement that you wouldn't normally expect. It's there. Why is that important? If we're going to try to get a straight line rip on that for a glue joint, it's going to go like that and give us a, a goofy... So then we try to go to the jointer to straighten up our mess, right? Sometimes it's burned, you got a bad saw blade and stuff like that. So one, my, my tip here, since this actually does move, is when in those situations when you need precision, take a clamp, a C-clamp if you need to, and clamp that down. Then all you're going to get is the deflection in the fence. Also when you feed, don't over push it. And let's talk about this. 
you made these. Have you made? I've made feather sticks. Yeah, I didn't have the nice magnetic. Yeah, we use them all the time. Okay, why do you use a feather board? Constant pressure, and so you don't have to worry about holding it in. So this, they sell these here. Uh, I've got five or six of them that that I've used, you know, since uh, Methuselah was a kid. But these are are magnetic. Put them in, flip the handle, and it's it's there. And the reason, let me figure out how to, there we go. Yeah, the reason you need it is because the pressure will be constant. So as you go through, all you have to do is this. And if you have a fence high enough that you could use a hold down, that would also give you constant pressure. That's not nearly as important as this way unless you're doing molding or something where the, where the height, the depth is important. But you don't have to get this feather board. This is a good one. You'll buy it once and have it. This is a, is a combination where, where you can put it on the fence and use this side as a hold down, or you can put it out here as a hold in. Yeah, I was oh. just going to say just make sure that you're basically fitting, you're setting your feather stick up on this side of the fence, of course. Yeah. Well, he's just using it as a prop, so. Yeah. You know. Let me, let me move this so we can do it. So you're basically you're, you're on the in-feed side of the blade, and you don't really want it right on the blade either, because you don't want to be pushing your, your waist into the blade. You wouldn't want to set it up here? No. Why not? Well, you'd be, be that's curved, a trick well, question, curved, Yeah, that's a trick question. Okay, see. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you'd be amazed how... I saw, I saw somebody, they had them set up like this. I mean, forget the, the finger, but they had them set up like that. What's wrong with that? Rob likes that for kick, kickback. Yeah. The, the emergency room doctor will be seeing you shortly, okay? Because uh, once you have uh, a curve here, then the, the board is essentially free floating and you'll push it into the blade and uh, it'll cause a kickback. And when it happens, you'll wonder what happened. Well, that's what happened. So, as Paul said, a good stopping point for this is just before it gets to the blade. Uh, this guard, by the way, I know a lot of you don't know what this is, a saw blade I guard. It really confused me today, too, yeah. because I haven't seen mine since uh, I bought the saw. I have, a prize, I have a prize spot for mine. It's on a nail about eight feet up in the air right there. Uh, but the, the riving knife, the, the back here, really chew, uh, serves to separate the, the blade. You might have heard that wood moves. Why? Internal stress. So just because the board's laying there flat, it's inanimate. When you run it through the saw, a lot of times it'll go out. If it goes out, you've got the fence here, you're cutting, and if it tends to go out, that will push it into the blade and get a possible kickback. If it closes in, and 2 by 4s are famous for this, if they close in, it'll just pinch down on the blade. Well, the this stand here, this is really a riving knife. That it'll just close down on that and be a little hard to push through, but it won't let it close down and pinch the blade. Okay, what am I missing so far? That's about it. And okay. I said, you guys, that, that we maybe we have removed these for some reason. I don't know why you would, but I've taken a, my, my table saw insert, and I've come back here in line with a blade and drilled a hole, and I just set a nail in that hole. If I've got wood that's closing up on me, and that nail works as a, as a splitter and keeps it from closing up on you. So when you need high precision, take the human element out as much as you can. Pre-plan where you're going to be, where your position is, and set up so you can feed continuously. You'll get a much better cut that way. Blades, if you need high precision, you need a really good blade. You need uh, um, something we use. Well, I've used Forest. Of course, that'll hurt your pocketbook a little bit. But Forest is good. Scarp has is good. Freud has something called a glue line rip blade which is excellent um, you need a lot of times when we do this we'll actually keep sharp blades for the finish cut and when we when we cut things like let's say we we're gonna we we're gonna cut this down we're gonna make at, uh, on this one at least three cuts we we cut it to size over about an eighth or so eighth to a quarter maybe eighth to a quarter oversize why because it, the wood's probably gonna move some and you want to go back, once you've made your, your approximate size cut, then go back and make a final cut. Okay? Just, 
and you're not going to do all of your woodwork in this way, just when you need stuff to be right. Okay. Um, you going to go in a straight lining with, with the table saw? Yeah, I think we'll do that next. Okay. Let's say, for example, we got this board out of the, um, the drop-off pile for cheap because we're cheap. So we've got some defects here and here, but I've got enough where, where I can use, especially this with all the, the, um, the figure in it, where I can glue up a door. But I know for a fact that this or this, neither one of them are straight. I just, I just know that. So if you put a straight line on it, you can easily verify that there is no way in the world that that is straight either side. So some of you run through a joiner, and I used to also. But you need about five years of uh, apprenticeship on a joiner to make that sucker cut right. Make your, your in-feed table the proper height for your out-feed table, be able to get the fence square, be able to hold your body and hold your breath for like three minutes while you run this piece through, and are not as easy to use as you would think. Not easy to use correctly, because you'll start out with a board that ends up pretty much parallel, and it'll, for, next thing you know, you got a wedge. Next thing you know, it comes out looking something like that because of uneven feed pressure and this and that. The other thing is snipe on the end. So in order to avoid all that, we're going to do a straight line rip. Well, what if you have something that is really, I mean, th this is close, but could we just run that against the fence and come out straight? No, why not? Hmm? Follow the curves. Yeah, it's gonna follow the curve, is right. So you're bored. Greatly exaggerated, but if you run this through the fence, this is going to touch here and then back here, and or up here it's yeah, going to it rock. Gets, once it gets past the edge of the fence, then it's going to fall off. Yeah, it's not possible. So we do our own version of the straight liner. Paul, this is your specialty. I got two straight lines for you. Yeah, I, I gave a door class a couple years ago, and basically what I what I how I straighten the board. I, if, if if this board, if I was going to use straight line this board, I'd have it like a six foot level instead of a four foot level. But we know our levels are straight, so I'll take my board and I'll take my level to it and I'll take and feed both of those past the fence. Now this outside edge, now it's going to be parallel to that level. So no matter how curved this piece is, I put my level there, I hold, I, a lot of times I'll do it very quickly, I'll just hold the pieces together and feed them together. And that's, you know, they, things will move a little bit. And after we've gotten it straight line like that, of course, uh, we may end up with some saw cuts. I don't know. When are you going to talk about the disc? You want to talk about the sanding disc here? Or? We, we can. Um, when you straight line this, you can reclaim wood. Um, that's got a, big, a couple big chunks out of it. And uh, if you had, let's say you got a piece of plywood, for example, that you want to use and you don't have a CNC um, and you don't want to clamp a straight edge to it, you could take. Uh, this straight edge, and, and we use usually duct tape, duct tape it on there, don't follow this side, but duct tape this on here and just run it through, and you can, it'll be straight arrow if you use your normal feeding uh, procedures. When you say don't follow this side, what do you, what do you mean? Don't, don't tape, tape don't. around here because oh, now this isn't the, flat. The or just stop it right here if you got, oh, okay. a, if you got a solid one. Okay. Um, it's just holding it there. I don't yeah. Guess. It's just really making a really long fence. What if you had something thicker than your saw will cut high and you're gonna to have to make two passes? What are you gonna do then? Band saw. Hmm? Band saw. <laughs> no? What are you gonna do? You know how to do it. Well, yeah. I'm gonna make my cut and flip it. Of course I'm gonna If you flip it though, you've got this on the bottom. Uh, now what? Stack that five levels. Yeah, put, put an auxiliary fence on your, your table saw, something that's high. So when the first time you run this through, it'll be low against the, your, your, uh, your extension. And then when you, turn, when you turn the whole thing over, it'll look like this, and it'll touch on the high side. Because we're going to make a cut here and then a cut here. So you can still use it. You just got to do one extra step and put an auxiliary fence. I mean, that's, yes. 
What step in squaring up this board are we? Is this your first step to run that one edge? Most of the time it is, not always, but it depends on what you're making and, and why and that. Uh, on this, I wouldn't, if I was going to cut it down to glue it together, cut short ones, mm -hmm. I'm going to cross cut it first, long. Okay, because the, well, the shorter piece of wood you can work with up to a point, the, the better it'll come out. What I was, where I was going with that, what if the board's in line? How do you take care of keeping it cut edge square? Right. Well, we're going to go into the yeah. We got, we'll get, we'll get into, into warpage and winding and stuff, yes. Can I just use, a let's say, a one and a half inch square metal tube instead of a, a level? As long as, 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 as long as it's straight and it won't bend. Uh, the one inch square metal tube will flex if it's uh, mild steel. A lot of times it'll flex in the middle, especially over a long run, right? And you'll get, you saw some deflection here. It wasn't really a lot. Yeah. But it really was when when we're trying to. They were talking about doing precision work. Otherwise, eh, you don't care. Most of the time, I would check the one inch stock, and if it worked out, stay with it. Because yeah, the longer the better. Depending upon how long the board is, what you're trying straight line. Yeah. Uh, this. Yeah, this is forty five bucks. This is a is a, a high precision aluminum straight edge that they sell here. This would be this would work great for doing what we're talking about. You could just tape your stuff to it and uh, run it through. But any straight edge that isn't going to flex in the middle. Yeah, okay. Angle iron will usually flex, so you can't use that. Yes, Rob? Yeah. You know, a lot of the levels that you get now are uh, like a phenolic material. And I've seen them flex. Uh, fle they flex a lot. Okay. So, you know, like your one that you're showing over there, I'm not sure about that one, but I've got one that's uh, over four foot long. Yeah. And as you yeah. move it, you know, it's got more of a, almost a rubbery base to it more than the hard plastic. And that one looks like a little bit of harder plastic, but if you take that, like you're running alongside there, as long as you're not putting much pressure on it, it'd be pretty good, but mine tends to flex. I, I've taken and put it down where I'm just marking marks on it. We, we most of the time use aluminum levels, good ones. I think you use Johnson. Yeah. Uh, pretty high dollar stuff. It's not gonna flex. Uh, they still make stuff like this out of aluminum that won't flex. And well, another thing, too. One, the wood one and some of those, like plastic ones, those plastic ones. Yeah, well, don't, don't use something that's going to flex. I don't care what it is, don't use it if it's going to flex. Also, you're not pushing here and here, you're pushing across the entire length. Right. So it would tend to flex. In fact, this, this, your only flexion would be between here and here. You don't have to worry about it. And this that. is really for quick, quick. If I'm doing something and I really, I've got sleds I make up. Right. I've got a, if I've got a board that's 10 foot long and I need to straighten it, I've got pieces of plywood that I've laid on top of each other and I've, I've shot together or screwed, screwed together so I know my plywood's nice and straight and then I've got a fence on it with some hold downs and I'll put that 10 foot board on that sled, clamp it in place, then feed everything through. So I can get a, I can get a nice straight edge on 16 foot boards if I wanted to. Which we're is we're really, used really to using difficult. sleds in a cross cut mode but you can also use them, they're carriers, they just carry and they give you something that is reliable to register against. The fence, yeah. You yeah, so the fence. consider your fence, consider your blade, and then consider your feeding method. Okay, we good? Are we good, I think, on straight line? Yeah. Yes. One of the things that I use in my shop a lot is uh, I had an opportunity to get uh, several uh, like two-inch square uh, aluminum extrusions uh, also some two and a half inch square ones and so they'd be great for something like this as you long know. as they're not thin wall yeah they're, they're they'd be great they're thick wall and what I also use them for what I primarily got them for was for uh, maintaining parallelism when you're doing a, a large glue up large panel glue up mm -hmm. where, you, where you go stick several boards together you clamp one of these things on top and bottom yeah, to, to eliminate any anomalies yeah. in the wood there you go we're going to show you, uh, by the time we get done, how to get this material flat enough to glue together just like that. Okay? Without a joiner. All right. So we good on straight line rip? Does that right. make sense? Is it new information for some of you? Okay. When I went to work with Paul, I thought they were pretty lucky to have me. <laughs> that was available. Got to get them all squared away. No. No, the very first job I did there was um, crown molding in a, in a downstairs kitchen, a uh, catering kitchen. And uh, what was it, five or six piece, something like that. And I thought, 
I'm pretty good. So I did something, came back about 20 minutes later, and the uh, foreman had pulled it all down. He says, you can't do better than that. You're not going to make it. I don't think he liked you, though, Ron. He never liked me. <laughs> but, so I did it again, and took me. normally it took me five or six hours to do it. This one took me two more days to do it. I got all done, and I said, well, how was that? It was the best trim job I had ever personally done. It was really cool. He goes, well, we just can't spend any more time on this, and, you know, obviously you don't know what you're doing. So we'll just have to live with it. <laughs> And that was my initiation into working with, uh, with and he wasn't the, the foreman. All right. But anyway, that's where I learned a whole lot of this stuff. So we've done our straight line rip. We've at least got uh, this side straight at whatever point we needed it to be straight. Okay. Could be way down the process. So next, um, I think we want to talk about getting stuff flat. Okay. Right? Does that make sense uh, now? Yeah, because yeah, that would maybe be one of your first steps to... Because okay. this board here, so this board here, we've got, and it was, it was pretty flat to begin with, so you could really start working with it once you straight lined it, probably. So, okay. But what if, what if you had that? Can you guys see that? <laughs> Not flat. Oh, I, we'll just we'll turn it over. That's, well, it's, it's touching right in here, though. Yeah, it's touching in the middle. That's really all I need. Okay. Um, and as long as this is, if you have a six inch joiner with a four foot bed, what is the possibility that you're gonna run that through a joiner and get it flat? No, zero. Zero, okay? This is gonna be one of those wedgies. It, you just, you might as well just go ahead and cut it up in little pieces and put it in the fireplace, because <laughs> that's what's gonna, what's gonna end up happening. So, I get on this job site, okay, and- Okay, uh, Father Ron, what about a drum sander? A little bit at the time, will that do it? No. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah, well, what about even a, if your table is longer? Even if your table is longer? No. The no. What about a planer? Yeah. Same, same part. Okay, same problem. Why? Because if you run it through this way, what a planer does is a planer makes one side parallel with the other side. Will it take out warp, <coughs> twist, wane, and cupping? <laughs> no. Just the other side will be all parallel and it'll twist like that. You'll have a, a really nice Ooh. propeller. Twist. So. Paul showed me something really cool. I've used it a thousand times. He's used it 50,000 times. So, no. There's another situation for sleds. Uh, I'll make a plywood sled so I know it's nice and flat. I'll take my board and say this piece of maple here is, is plywood, my plywood sled. And I, I like to work on my backup table behind my table so I've taken my levels and everything. When I set something on my backup table, I know it's flat. I've crossed it. I've checked to make sure it's not winding. It's, it's nice and flat. This is while you're doing the assembly. And so they say, I've taken my ply, I've made a sled up, say this piece of maple, like I said, is, a, is a, a piece of plywood. It may be a single layer for short pieces, or it may be a double layer where I've kind of staggered my joints and I can make a board. Like I said, I've run 12 to 14 foot boards trying to get them straight. You know, some, so. Well, here we're talking about trying to get them flat. Flat, I'm sorry, flat, flat, not straight, but flat. So I've taken, this board, you can see, now if you put this in the planer, what's going to happen is just going to push it down, and then when, you come, when it comes out the other end, then it's just going to spring back up. It'll be smooth and parallel. <laughs> mm -hmm. It'll be curved. So basically, I've taken my, I'll take my board and I'll fasten either maybe a block of wood here, or I'll actually even put a screw out here and make sure it's low enough that it's not going to contact the cutter heads on both ends. So now the board is stationary on my carrier. But we still got the problem of it flexing up and down. So I make my little shims. I think I've showed you all my little shim jigs before. And I'll come along here and I'll slide them in underneath my board and take a little pinner. I've got a little headless pinner, like a 23 gauge pinner. And I'll pin those in place. And I'll go ahead and I'll stack, just stack my wedges in here so that the board cannot flex now. It stays solid. And if it has twists, you just kind of shim it so that everything's going to stay stationary. Nothing's going to move. And once I've got that where it's stationary and it's flat on that board, then I'll take the whole sled and the board and I'll pass it through the planer. So when it comes out, when you first, the first couple of passes you're going to make, it's not going to touch up here at all, just like working on a joint. You're not going to make any contact. Or, or if it does, like the first time I did it, it stops about right here and 
the machine yeah. starts smoking and it'll pop Separate breakers and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. when you take your measurement, you want to take from the, you know what I'll do is I'll put something flat on there, I'll take my tape measure and I'll measure what, what I have there and that's what I'll set my planer to. I'll, take, I'll set it to the thickest point and I'll pass this through the planer and eventually I'll take all the high spot off and then eventually I'll have a nice smooth cut all the way down and it'll be flat. I could take my level at that point, my six foot level, and I could put it on that and it would touch all the way through to me. Wouldn't be any daylight coming up underneath that level. Paul, how many how many interior doors did you make for that place? Oh, like 15 or 20? At least 14 to 15. We sat down uh, one time on the job and calculated between the material and the labor uh, these fantastic interior doors in this mansion. Most of them are two inches thick, generally three feet wide. Um, some of them normal 80 inch heights, a lot of them higher. And they, the uh, s the styles on these things were a lot of times four, five, six inches wide, and it'd be solid white oak, solid mahogany, solid cherry. They'd be solid material like this. So uh, when when we got the material in from Atlanta Hardwoods, a lot of times it'd look exactly like that, and yeah. you'd have to get it get it flat, dead flat, and then do the square stuff. And this is a trick that Paul used on white oak that was so big that he'd say, hey, Ron, grab the end of that piece, you know, put it up on the table and get it dead flat. You end up with about, about a piece about that thing that you Oh, no, level. no. <laughs> well, it all depends on how bad it is. I mean, you really, uh, when you start looking at wood, we were talking earlier, maybe an eighth inch uh, to a quarter inch for straight lining. Sometimes when it comes to flattening, you got to allow yourself a half inch. If you want an inch and a half bore, you better buy maybe two inches. Unless you're hand selecting. Now, if I'm going to Swanee Lumber, but we didn't hand select, I'd get on the phone and say, hey, ship me 400 board feet of maple or whatever, eight quarter stock. So I didn't know what was coming in. And I found, I mean, Mark, this other guy we had working with, he, he did bring a joiner in. He did a lot of joiner, flattening on the joiner and stuff. <coughs> but I feel that this method saved me material versus the joiner. He would get a board flat, but he used, I think he used a lot more material, would go through a lot more material. I could, I could sneak by if I needed a two inch board or an inch and three quarter board and they sent me an a eight quarter board and I only got a quarter inch to play with and it had some kind of twist and warp to it. I, I felt I could get more use out of the board with this method than by trying to push a board over the joiner. I mean, I'm not that experienced with the joiner. I'm sure some guys that have worked with the joiners a lot of times could probably come out with a nice flat board and a few passes, but it seems to me like I'm constantly feeding that thing, trying to get a flat edge. And this one, I know it's never going to move. Every time I pass that pass, the, uh, the cutter head is in the same position. Okay, a couple, couple of summary. When you, when you first lock this down, if it's got a little warp or something to it, figure out which end is going to be touching the board. Anchor that, and then shim the other end and anchor that. Second thing, this, you have to assemble it on a flat, a dead flat table. Because if the table is not flat, then you're going to assemble it exactly the way it's going to mirror the table. Okay, we had a question? Yes. yes. Okay. Once you get the first side done, then you, you use the sled. No, once you've got the first slide, then you just take and run it through your run through the right. Right. Yeah. Because well, you know the side's dead flat. On the longer stock, what's the sled made out of? Plywood. I usually take and rip a couple of uh, rips of plywood and I'll double them up and screw them down and just try to build a little stiffness in it. It's decent plywood. This is not CDX that you're yes, making yeah. this stuff out of. You know, this is generally bird chore or... or uh, yeah, you yeah, you want something fairly flat. Yeah, you want some you decent plywood. the joints, I think you said, too. Yeah. Right. If you're... Yeah. And if I have... Uh, if i got a piece of plywood and it starts to belly up on me, I actually screw it to the table because I want to... If I can get everything flat and parallel, it can kind of move a little bit in the, in the, uh, in the planer. But if it's flat and parallel, if, 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 I, if the board, if I set the plywood down on the table and it's got a belly on it, I'll clamp that board down flat because I know my table's flat. So when I put my other board that I'm going to plane in there and I wedge it, then all I know all these wedges and that pair of that bottom edge, by the time it goes to the planer, it's still going to give me a flat surface up here. Because after a while, after a while, you stand your jigs up against the wall. They're going to take a little, little belly to them. We'll answer your question in a minute. Show them the, the jig. The jig? The wedge making jig. Oh, I, yeah, okay. Not everybody saw it. Yeah. It's a little uh, shim cutter, I call it. And see, again, it's just got that quarter inch notch in it. And I take a board, I cut a board about seven inches long. And well, we don't have a nice. That's little, okay. Yeah. And just. 
have a, a, a board that could be this wide and just run it through here and that'll cut off what comes out is a wedge. And then you keep flipping your board. As you cut, you flip your board. We, you only use these like in five gallon buckets. <laughs> yeah. I always okay. have a, a good bucket oh, and a handful yeah. of those things around. Yeah. yeah. You can pass that around if you want. Okay. Uh, okay, somebody had a question. Yes. Okay, now, put if, a wedge with it. If the board has a DNA that it's going to warp. If it's got a well, DNA that's going to warp, then put it's it in the fireplace. Go. Okay, <laughs> what's going to happen when you cut out the bow? How long is it going to be before it bows some more? If, if it's in the wood that it's going to bow, <laughs> God and all his angels ain't going to happen in it. It's going to boat. If I take it and out of that jig, when I take it in there and I set it on the table and it's giving me a hard time, then it's time for the fireplace. Lay hands on it. Anoint it with oil. <laughs> See if it will heal. But I, I think that that's something, some boards... That some boards will do that for sure. You can straighten it, but next week it's going to be... That's absolutely true. And yeah. so now we got to have wisdom to well, know it, what board is going to do that and what board ain't. But well, why does it do that? Huh? Why would it move? Oh, it's, it's, no, it's not dry. It's not properly seasoned. This this stuff is not green wood. When you're doing this, you're doing it to seven, so. seven or eight percent moisture content. Okay, I mean seasoned, good, stable stuff. And depending on how much material you move, you, you remove. You know, it, it could move a little bit. And by the way, you know, when if you treat one side, you do the same treatment to the other side. I'm talking about when you're putting a finish on or something. No, I'm talking about oh, uh, talking like if you plane right, one side, right, right. you need to plane the other side uh, so it will absorb and release moisture at the same rate. We had another question over here. Yeah, I was asking him if he always used hardwood for wedge. No, because I use the hardwood if I want to move something. I'll use I will look for the hardest wood I've got on the site. If I want to put wedges in and snap them, then I'll go ahead and grab a piece of pine. If I'm shimming a door or something like that, or if I'm shimming somewhere, I just want to reach over and snap that wedge, then I'll grab a piece of pine. If I want to move something, I'll grab a piece of solid oak and a sledgehammer, and it's going to move to where I want it to go, unless it's absolutely, totally stubborn. Though. Okay, so you run this through, you're going to end up with a cut about here, second pass probably here, and so on. So you kind of work out to it. Then you just remove it, flip it over, and run it through your planer. Or you might have to go the other way. You need to read the wood, read the direction, read the, read the grain. But that will help a lot, especially on wood that is, is warped and treated like that. All right. Any other questions? You can follow a similar process for propeller wood? <laughs> uh, yes, you follow a similar process for propeller wood is the question. And, and if it's propellering up like that, attach, figure out which end you're going to attach and then wedge up the other side as well as, as in here. The point is you want it to be stable. You're, uh, when you run a piece of wood through a joiner, through a, uh, through a planer, the rollers, the pinch rollers, will, will squash it flat. And then when it comes out, it springs right back. Well, if you put the, uh, the wedges under there to support it, when it goes through there, it can't move and it'll give you a dead flat surface. Okay. Well, maybe one point on straight lining a board, if you've got a board in the shop and you really want to use it, and this works for a joiner too, the first step I'll do, if I, I'll take a line and I'll snap it, then I'll take my skill saw and I'll cut that snap line. Now I'm not fooling on that joiner or the planer for nine million passes. I saw a guy in a, at a shop up in, uh, in a stir working shop, and he had a board that was had a hell of a curve, and he's up there and he's passing that board. He's, I mean, so man, he's, he's spent 30 minutes on that joiner trying to flatten, straighten that side. So why didn't you cut it with your skill saw first? Or a bandsaw. Yeah, anything. Just get it get pretty close. straight. Get it close. The, the, the mantra that Paul uses is sneak up on it. You get it close first by the, the coarse methods, and then you fine-tune it where it's absolute perfection. Okay. Let me ask you this. Have you ever used a, a board that was straight and tacked it to the other board to cut a straight line? Sure. And that's basically the same principle yeah, same, as the uh, of using the level. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. It just yeah, needs to be straight. Tap it down. Well, they actually make sleds. The, the sled, let's assume, let's assume that we have a straight line here. 
this isn't straight, but assume that this is a, a straight edge. They actually make uh, sleds like this with clamps where you would take, let's just use this, where you would take the board you're trying to straight line and clamp it, and this is nothing more than a carrier. Yeah. And even though this isn't touching the, the saw, you're still going to get a straight line. Yeah, rock hard wood clamp would be happy to sell you one. Yeah, well, they probably got them here, for all I know. Okay. Ron? Yes. When you're doing that, when you fasten a board on top of another, or fasten a straight board on top of that to, to cut a straight edge, would you put the, the, the board you're cutting on the bottom or put it on the top? No, your sled would ride like here. Yes. And your clamps are up here. And the like board would be on top just like I had it. Yeah. And then you just, let, you just let it hang over a little bit here. You take, you've seen the clamps out there, you just take. And of course, my clamps, I'm cheap, so I don't buy clamps. What I do is I take a, a block of wood, two by two or something, I'll screw it down here so it stands up above a little bit. Then I just take my shim and I just push it up underneath there. This is his clamp. Yeah. If this was, a, I'd have a board. I'd have a board sticking out over here a little bit, and I'd just take and I'd put my shim in there. Because I said I don't want to buy clamps. They cost money. If I'm working on a job and the material's free, I can cut these all day. But the board you're the board you're cutting is on top. There's a space between that yeah. and the table. Yeah. Yeah. Just like what you see right here. Yeah. Yeah. But do you feather that a lot? You just hang What's that? Do you feather yeah, that yeah, the like the very much with the blade. Yeah. Why feather? You what do you mean by feather? Well, we're not. This is not a final cut. Uh, okay. It's a dead bang straight line, but it, we're not final cut. Yeah. That's what we're going to get to next. And even if you, uh, I mean, you're going to have tear out. Depending upon the blade, the better the blade, the less tear out you're going to have. You know, this is a 40 tooth blade, so yeah, we probably have some tear out on that. But it's okay. especially if you're doing your rip, you want a 40 tooth blade, otherwise you're just going to burn the hell out of it. Yeah, this is not the final cut. Remember, I said we sneak up on it. We're just trying to get it straight, so we and may not even be the final width. In fact, it's not the final width. Okay, Paul introduced me to a secret weapon. So I went out and bought one, and I love it. And based on my success with that, uh, I sold my joiner. And I used this for the full year and a half I was there. I used it virtually every day. And do you remember what it cost? Uh, I'm thinking around $40. For for, yeah, that's exact. $39.95. That, I remember yeah. that now. Um, this is not what you think it is. It's not exactly what you think it is. This is a sanding disc, and it's not parallel front to back. This front edge, I guess we could probably draw that up here, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. Go ahead. Illustrator. Well, the one side of the disc is flat, and the other side of the disc has a three degree bevel on it. And what that bevel is, when you put that into the saw, then you tilt your saw, so now the disc bevel is parallel to the, or perpendicular to the, to the tape. You guys see that? This side is three degrees, this side is flat. So when you put it in the saw, you tilt it over three degrees. And what that gives you is an infeed. Basically, yeah, that, that bevel would come right. all the way out. It, you, it, this will only contact the wood in this area, right? Yeah, so that, that what that does gives you an infeed. only contact out. the wood in this area right here. If it was parallel to the fence, you wouldn't be able to feed it in. It would right. start to jam up on it. And it would be rubbing from here to here, and it would burn like crazy. Oh. But that three degree, the very, the very first one I owned back when I was, uh, well, 25, whatever, I didn't understand a damn thing. And by the time I understood it, I'd lost it and couldn't find it. And then it took me years to find that. I bought that from, I think, uh, Woodworking Supply of New Mexico. Of New Mexico. It's the only place I've ever found it. You can buy flat discs everywhere. To get that three degree That's bevel. Where I had my first one was from Sears. Yeah, yep. they had them in the 40s and 50s. When you, yeah. bought it, when you bought the kit, they had the dado blade, the wobble dado, they had the disc, and a few other items. And like I said, by the time I figured out what the hell it was for, I didn't know where it was anymore. So what the hell is okay. three degree bevel for? 80 grit? Uh, probably 80 grit on that right Most now. of the time, you want, a, you want a fairly coarse grit, and running in a table saw at 6,000 RPMs, It'll give you a pretty smooth finish. It'll give you a, a glue surface. This takes away all your saw cuts. Okay. If you've got, you're running a blade, if you're not running a forest blade, you can go by with a much cheaper blade. You can run with that 40 inch, that 40 tooth blade. You'd end up with all those saw cuts and nastiness. 
You put this disc on, and you're only going to take a little bit with this disc. Don't try From to take too much. second to a sixteenth. Thirty second most of the time. Most of the time. I wouldn't even say sixteenth, which that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. So you want to just kind of set that up. That's just going to take away the saw marks, and it's going to kind of straighten it a little bit. Because the fence, you're going to actually, I've actually straightened boards a little bit with this, with just the fence. Yeah, I put the disc in, and the board's only so, so long, a number of passes, flipping it back and forth, and I can come out with a pretty quick board that's almost clampable. I've got to put a little extra pressure on it, maybe. I know we're not supposed to put too much pressure on our clamped up pieces, because they'll spring apart and all that, but, you know, sometimes you can cheat and get away with it. The great thing about this is it works with the wider boards but also works with molding. Did you go over this in the molding class? Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, if you're going to do applied moldings where you shape an edge and then rip this off, that is never going to be straight. Ever, ever, never, ever. I don't care who you are, he can't even do it. So then when you put, uh, put this back in your table saw and tilt it over three degrees, you can run a little molding through there, and it'll come out exactly the right width. And that your edges are, if you set this up right, your edges are absolutely straight. Uh, you're you're hold, hold, hold on one second. You're setting that bevel plumb with a square to the table. Right, absolutely. Yeah, if it's three degrees, now it, and I don't the trust surface it. is nice. I use a square, like you said, and I take yeah. a little speed square, set it up there, and I bring it right over. Right. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you said it's woofer for supply of... Uh, of New Mexico. Okay. What you, you know what it's guys called? Out here, it's a in the store. They call it a conical disc or what? Sanding disc. Sanding disc, disc. Sanding disc. Yeah. And you got to read in the description, the fine print, it goes one side uh, perpendicular, the other side three degrees, and it's in like six point type. Um, we'll try to find the link for you. I, I, the first time I ever saw that was with uh, shop Oh, yeah. uh, I'm sure it's been around forever. I didn't know about it, but it's absolutely wonderful. And it worked great. Right. Yeah. Yeah, if you understand the three degrees and how it's used, and to make light cuts, it is spectacular. Okay, questions over here. I think it's woodworker.com if I just found it. Woodworker.com, okay. Well, anyway, they're... They are wonderful. Are we done with this? I think we're done with that unless somebody... Yeah, we can pass it around. Okay. Is your sandpaper stuck on that? Yes, that's right. PSA. So you can replace it. Yeah. Now, he keeps this in absolute pristine condition. Yeah. I called him this morning at a quarter to seven. I said, Paul... I've turned my shop upside down. I can't find my disc. And what I've done, because a lot of times you have you buy your disc and it's solid. So I've taken and made my little jig. I've got a, an X-Acto knife on a, on a beam of wood and a screw. So I'll come in and I'll spring, spin that sand around paper. and yeah. cut my sandpaper hole out in the middle. How's that help on there with the easy? Yeah, right. PSA. PSA, PSA yeah. pressure sensitive adhesive. How do you take it off? Peel it off. You peel it off, and, and then you, you got to clean the disc. Then you take your acetone, you got to clean up the residue and get yeah. the residue off the disc. Right. Yeah. But you, this, geez, you can run, I don't know, 5,000 board feet through it, pass it. As long as you don't try to take off too much because yeah. it'll burn the hell out. It'll burn it if you. If you also, it works extremely well for plywood, too. Oh, yeah. But there is clean nothing that it won't. We've done everything from mahogany to white oak to walnut to. Yeah. I have done that with plywood when I was building cheap cabinets. Yeah. And I styles and rails, and all I did is clean up the edge of the plywood, and off I went. This is almost like a miracle tool. I mean, it really is. You'll, you'll love it once you use it. And do I sell them? No. I just, this is one of the secrets I learned from Paul. Okay, Ron, so. I got one of those with my old radio arm saw from. What's that, a radio arm saw? Has yeah. it got the bevel? <laughs> Has it got the three got degree the bevel? bevel? Yeah, there you it. go. That well, probably came from Sears. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Sears. I think it was an eight inch disc I had at Sears. Yeah. And, it was a 10 inch. Was it a 10 inch? Yeah. I, I, I did find a 10 inch disc, but it's it's flat on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. I said, well, that ain't it. Okay, so we have been talking so far about the, the long edges. We haven't talked about any of the cross cuts. So before we move on, everybody good? Is there anything you don't understand? When you're doing the, I find when we're trying to do a full sheet of plywood, Trying to hold it against the fence while we're feeding it in there. Yep. You know, we're just trying to rip it all the way down the length. Are we better off to do it with, uh, you know, on the table saw or like you tell them to draw a line and do it with a. Well, the, the standard response is it depends. Yeah, I like it. I like my table saw. I mean, if I if I have to work outside, I use a, 
but with a, bit, with a piece of plywood, I find the best position is off the corner of the wood, one hand pushing in a little bit, and one hand behind, and walking it through the blade. Now, there's an assumption here. Paul has the very, or had, I don't know if you still got it, had the very best table saw set up I've ever, ever seen. He's got a big old Powermatic, and on this side, he's got an, an outfeed table that goes over here that's the same, same width. Oh, I'm getting reversed. Yes. But on the outfeed side... Well, I've got a backup, what I call a backup table. Yeah, backup table. It's four feet wide and I think six feet long. Six, six, six or six. And it is married to the table saw so that it's dead flat. And he can pick up a piece of plywood and run it through here and it doesn't fall on the floor because it goes on that table. Yeah, that's the big, big key thing right there. Yeah. Having a backup table. He's, he's got this huge work table with a table saw mounted in the middle of it. Yeah, and working in the garage. <laughs> well, that's I actually it. worked in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> it works great in the garage because it, it, it does work as, a, if, if you're working by yourself, you, you can use it for an assembly table. But the problem is, as soon as you get something halfway assembled, then you remember you got to rip something. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you have to run off your your poor helper like every twenty minutes. Yeah. So I guess that would be working by yourself. If you're working yes. with other people in the yeah. shop, and that's not, you can't use that for an assembly table. So, so, yeah. So, is that so a freestanding free table that you can move away from? No, the it could be, but I don't. I've got it attached. Okay. I've got it. I got well, it. But you could unhook it. You could. I have unhooked it, moved it, but it basically I that, keep it. It's basically something like this, uh, with the big the big legs and stuff. It's just four feet wide, six feet long, and on this end of it, you made um, bolts or something where it actually attached to the table saw. Right. Well, I've got yeah, I've got it. The, the reason the reason for that is so your outfeed would be everything would be the same height. That your outfeed table would be the same height as this. But 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 if it's married to it, then how do you clamp your fence down? What do you do? To There's a uh, cutouts. I have a little a little bit of space, about so much so much space. And what I do is I have a little block right behind the blade because when I cut these shims, I don't want my shims falling down. Because I, when I cut shims, I just keep pushing, 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 and they end up with a, on a big pile back there. If I didn't have that little bit of uh, space filled in, then my shims would fall down and it would be a pain. But the one thing you do have to remember when you make that big backup table is you got to put slots in it. Yep. <laughs> What kind of fence are you running on yourself? Huh? I have uh, the Powermatic has something very similar to the Bismire. I don't think it's. I think they put their own name on it. You know, back when the. But it's a Bismire style tube fence. Yeah, it's a, it's a T fence. Locks on the front. It locks on the front only. Yep. And that's when. When I have to really, like I said, I need to get what I had for my hold ins I had. Uh, I don't see them anymore, but they used to have rollers that would hold in and roll. Mm -hmm. They would pull saw, things in. Saw buddies. Saw buddies, I guess they would call. So I've got some of those when I really want to hold things in. So that's when I have to clamp the back of the fence down because otherwise when I'm trying to hold it, then the, then the back of the fence comes up. I had to mount some. I had to buy the T-tracks and screw them to the top of the fence, but they work out pretty good. I haven't seen them on the market lately. I guess I haven't. Of course, I haven't bought things in a long time, it seems like. I think that, uh, that fence for the original Polymatic wasn't labeled, but it was actually made by Beesmeyer. Yeah, I'm thinking so too. Of course, they, they, you've got replaceable faces. Right. They put they painted it their own color and everything. It's a paramatic yellow. The right. original 66 fence was a cast iron. It worked just like a uh, Delta jet line. Yeah. Well, this That's is a little, back little, little later before my time, huh? Well, it's beginning with the 66. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, this, That's is, what I, yeah, this is actually taking a lot longer than I thought it would, which I guess is a good thing. Uh, but the other thing we got to talk about is is squares. How do you, how do you how do you cut straight across? Especially how would how would we do it here? Radial arm. Radial arm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> George, I love you, so I'm not I'm not going to respond. I'm going to give you a pass on that. Um, we well, could use a you could use a chop saw, a good chop saw, as long as you know you got the the cross cut. But um, a lot of times you don't, and a lot of times they'll move. There's you know they're not rigid, so then you, that's why at that point and Paul has these too, but uh, he makes his didn't buy them. You guys have all seen the sleds, right? This is a, is a factory made one. A guy named Jerry Cole makes these, and this is not set up for this saw. 
so I can't actually put it in the miter slot. It's got a, got a guide and it'll follow the miter slot. And when you get this, you cut it to fit your saw. So I'm not going to put it in there. This is literally just an outfeed support. It doesn't move. It stays right there. And you slide this. The idea being that this is 90 degrees to the blade. You need stability. Um, you need to lock this down and take you out of the equation as much as humanly possible. Meaning lock this thing down and just push it through. And it's always better if you don't pull it back through. <laughs> How do I know this? Inkra makes something like that, I believe. Lots of people make them. You can make your own out of plywood. You just need to make absolutely sure that this to here is dead bang right on 90 degrees. And, they, and then lock, I lock it down permanently. This one moves. Um, this one is $180. This is um, 30 bucks. the outfeed table. Jerry has sold many, many, many thousands, probably, you know, 15,000 because it's been out for years. Inkra makes one. Um, I don't know who else does. I've probably got seven or eight of them. And Paul, and, and the plans are all over the internet for this. And normally the ones that we make, the whole thing slides and you cut up the middle and you've got a bridge here that ties the two halves together. So they, they move in unison. Um, for less than 20 bucks if you got some crap lumber. Yeah, don't make it out of CDX plywood. Use good plywood. Seriously. These jigs, if you want them to be accurate, you got to use good material. Uh, they don't have to be extruded aluminum for the fences and stuff, but it, it does need to be flat. If this is going to be your fence, that sucker needs to be flat, parallel, square, the whole deal. And this works. Yep. Go ahead. This fence is nice because it does have uh, stops in it. You know, you can. These are adjustables, I guess. And yeah, you can make these one really fancy. Nice, I use a clamp and a block of wood. <laughs> Carl. Uh, we have that, but the only problem is, it when, is the piece of wood that's on the end yeah. is a little bit thicker than the aluminum. So. What are we talking about? <coughs> that wood. Oh, well, this? Yes. Yeah. It's a little bit thicker than the piece of aluminum. Actually, this is thinner. So the, on ours is thicker, so it falls off. A little bit. You need to tweak it. Yeah. You need to but sand it down. Yeah. Anybody here use hand planes? Rare you do? Right. When, when, uh, when I was with Woodline, and I'm not with them anymore, but when I was with Woodline, one of the things we did was take a block of wood like that and flatten it dead flat. And you take your hand plane and you go at 40, well, first of all, you go straight across at 90 degrees, which seems counterintuitive. But you, you literally take your plane, go straight across at 45, at 90, then come back and do 45. And if it's rough like this, I'd probably do 45 the other way. And then if I'm pulling, I go this way. If I'm pushing, I go that way to get it flat. And when you're done, you put winding sticks on there. It's amazing. It's just flat. It's absolutely amazing. Now, is this side parallel with this one? Not yet. So you'd run it through, you'd turn it over, run it through the joiner. But if you have something really thick, it's too big for your table saw, or you got one of those little 10-inch direct drive contractor $29 table saws <laughs> that you got at a garage sale somewhere because it didn't work then either, okay, and you want to do it with, and you don't have a whole lot of work to do, that, that 90, 45, and then straight method works really well. Okay, we got, gee whiz, we ate up our time. All right, let, let me, uh, so that I, I do respect your time, and we're out of time, so let me uh, summarize. Do we have any quick questions before I do that? No quick questions. Okay, Paul, I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. What we learned is that you need to straight line rip. You need to sneak up on things. We're talking about really precision when you need it, which is not all the time. Uh, I, we introduced you to the disc with the three-degree bevel. We talked a little bit about, uh, for cross-cutting stuff, we talked a little bit about sleds. And uh, that is pretty much it for Foursquare. Now next week, they said they're going to talk about joiners. So take what we've taught you here, attend the joiner class, and then figure out what you want to do. But as far as I know, uh, 40 bucks is a whole lot cheaper than the cost of a new joiner. One through six inches wide. And you yeah. found it, huh? Yeah, that device that uh, Ron's pointing out there, I, I found it on the internet. 
Okay, how much is it? It's about 40 bucks. And it's got that, uh, what size? That's Woodworkers Supply of New Mexico. 46. Yeah. That's it. Okay, it's 46. Well, it's gone up over the last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you, sir.